brilliant. Awesome. Okay, well, we have like a micro quorum right now, but I expect that we'll be up to uh, maybe seven to 10 people within the next 10 minutes or so. Um, regardless, uh, uh, Nicholas, thank you very much for joining us today. I'm super excited about this talk. I, I think others are too. Um, I think this is one of the like more creative hacks that I've seen in the last year. And, and that's kind <laughs> of inherently exciting. And, and so with that, um, I'll, I'll give you the floor and uh, we're excited to have you. So um, you should be able to share screen if you want to, if you have any issue, let me know. Brilliant, thank you very much. Uh, let me see if I can get this screen shared. Give me just one moment. No worries. I think it's fair to say this is the first time we've had a, a guest that has basically invented a bug class. So I'm pretty excited. <laughs> I've got a lot of questions. Yeah, that's true. Brilliant. All right. Let's see. So it has decided that it wants to take over all three of my monitors when I hit present and presumably one of these buttons will actually do the trick. All right. So let's do that. Good, share, and now, come on. And there we go. All right, I think that will do it. Can, can you see the presentation now? Yeah, it looks good. Very good. All right, cool. Uh, well, thank you very much for having me to this group. My name is uh, Nicholas Boucher. I'm coming in from England right now. Uh, I'm a PhD candidate at the University of Cambridge. Uh, and uh, this talk is going to be on the recent paper, Trojan Source, Invisible Vulnerabilities. So kicking it off, um, I kind of divided this story into a few different chapters. And I think that uh, this particular vulnerability that the paper is about uh, lends itself well to uh, kind of a narrative style story. So uh, we'll, as I imagine, this group goes with uh, kind of faster presentations and a, a longer discussion period. So I'll, uh, I'll aim to do that, uh, but diving right in. Uh, so a little bit of background. Uh, Unicode uh, is a text encoding standard. Uh, it is in many ways the successor to ASCII, which was our uh, more basic text encoding standard that uh, supported primarily uh, English language via uh, basic Latin characters. Uh, and then Unicode comes along and as of version 14, uh, supports about 144,000 characters across about 154 different scripts. Included in that is lots of different control characters uh, and a whole bunch of uh, crazy things like uh, private blocks that you can define your own characters and uh, support for various different ancient languages uh, and, and the like. So bottom line is it's a, a very expressive text encoding standard. And uh, each character inside of this specification uh, is encoded as a code point. Uh, and that code point uh, takes the form of a number in hex, usually prefaced with a U plus before it. So here we have uh, a character from the Cyrillic alphabet and uh, showing you that it's encoded as Unicode character hex 416. Uh, and there is uh, again, quite a, quite a plethora of different characters. And, and I want to um, you know, preface, preface the vulnerability that we're about to talk about with the context that uh, caused this vulnerability to, to arise. So there was some earlier work that myself and some colleagues had done uh, in the world of adversarial machine learning. Uh, and what we had found was that if we used valid but uncommon uh, methods to encode different characters, uh, we could cause uh, text-based machine learning systems to basically fall apart to uh, get to the point where they're outputting garbage, uh, even for models that otherwise were very highly performant. And um, realistically, this is targeting natural language processing because that's the majority of um, text-based machine learning models that it's not per se specific to natural language. And, and what we had come up with were four different techniques. Uh, and these techniques were uh, first uh, using invisible characters. So the Unicode specification defines things like the zero width space, uh, which is a character that uh, is exactly what it sounds like. It, it makes no modification to the screen when it's rendered. It is literally a zero pixel wide, zero pixel tall uh, character that does uh, absolutely nothing the vast majority of the time. There are syntactic reasons that it exists. It turns out 
that in various different languages, um, invisible characters will uh, make a difference to how um, how surrounding characters are, are formatted. But uh, in the context of um, the vast majority of the world's languages, invisible characters do absolutely nothing, yet they represent um, characters that you can encode as Unicode code points. Um, the second technique that we had proposed uh, was using homoglyphs. And, and there's actually a really rich history of, of homoglyphs and uh, various different attacks. And, and to define that word, just in case it's um, less familiar, these are characters that uh, look very similar to each other, sometimes are exactly the same um, character when they're rendered, but are represented by different Unicode code points. So uh, one example of this, uh, if you think about, say, English and Russian or their underlying character sets, Latin and, and Cyrillic character sets, uh, there are uh, quite, there's quite a lot of overlap uh, between these, these alphabets. So for example, the uh, Latin character H has uh, a very, very similar looking character in the Cyrillic alphabet that uh, is defined differently within the Unicode specification. That is to say that uh, it has a unique code point or when you take this text and you save it to disk, it's represented by a, a different set of zeros and ones than the Latin H. And yet when you render them, they look exactly the same. Um, the third technique that we came up with was, and this is going to come back in just a few minutes, uh, reorderings. And, and the idea behind this is that uh, if, if I have uh, uh, characters that uh, are, are encoded in a, a backwards order, I can put a right to left override character at the beginning of them uh, and, and cause them to display uh, in the reverse of the order that they're logically encoded. Uh, but if I had reversed those characters before I had logically encoded them, they will show up um, as if they were um, not perturbed at the encoding level whatsoever. Uh, and, and I'll dive in just a few minutes into what that actually looks like in practice, because that's the uh, underlying source of this, um, this Trojan source attack that we're going to be moving towards in a minute. Uh, and, and the last thing that we came up with was uh, the idea of these deletion characters. And this is about as simple as it gets. You know, your character has a, a back, or your keyboard has a backspace button on it. Uh, and when you hit that backspace button, it uh, injects a control character into whatever text field you're modifying that says, please remove the previous character. It turns out you can take that same control character and a handful of others and just inject them into encoded text. And when that encoded text is rendered, the character preceding the deletion character just won't render. Uh, and you can use this to inject all sorts of uh, just random stuff of your choosing into strings uh, that when they're rendered just um, you know, aren't visible. And in these four different techniques, we found that we could use them to generate perturbations that um, would, would take some visible form of text, change the encoding of that text, but, but maintain the same visual representation that we started out with. And when we take uh, those perturbed strings and we uh, put them into machine learning models for inference purposes, uh, and, and see what we come up with, we find out that the results are, are just very um, low performance relative to the baseline performance uh, of whatever model we're looking at. And this really ranges across a, a whole different series of models. I'll give some examples on the next slide, but um, if this is something that is of interest, uh, I created a tool that's online. It lives at the URL imperceptible.ml. Uh, and you can go there and uh, put in some text and it'll generate random perturbations that contain your selection of these four different techniques. Uh, and that will um, be something that just has this, this garbled Unicode representation that will cause whatever machine learning model is ingesting these characters to perform absolutely terribly. Uh, and to give an example uh, of, of uh, uh, what this actually looks like in practice. Uh, so uh, say you had a model that was doing translation. It was translating English to French. Uh, and what we had was some input saying, send money to account one, two, three, four. By injecting just a single character uh, and then switching the order of one, two, three, four, uh, we can uh, have a model that while we have an input that is visually the same as the input that we started with, this perturbed input, this adversarial example, will um, output a translation that is uh, very different than, than what we put in. So it will output the English equivalent of send it, saying send the money to account 4321 instead of 1234 because logically what we've done is we've reversed the uh, encoding of, of the numbers of this, this artificial bank account, this metaphorical bank account that we've 
come up with. Um, but in a totally different domain, you might have machine learning models that do toxic content detection. So these are uh, things that you might have, uh, say, running on social media platforms like Facebook, or you might have running on uh, comments fields on various different websites. Uh, and what we found is that, uh, once again, by injecting these uh, perturbations using various different Unicode encodings, we can take something that uh, we, we have the input here, you are a coward and a fool, uh, which uh, it, before we do any perturbations comes out as 96.8% uh, toxic from the, the model that we tested against. But after we put in those perturbations, it comes out just 8.2% toxic, or after we take, um, you know, uh, we, we render this into a, a Boolean that would be, would be non-toxic. Uh, and then uh, there's also this idea of, of natural language inference. It's a, a task that uh, is quite common to use in the machine learning setting as a, as a baseline for the performance of various different adversarial ML techniques and the like. And uh, we found that it, it breaks this task as well, um, but without going into the details of that too much, because it's a little tangential to the, to the overall picture. So um, bottom line is we found that uh, these different text perturbation techniques that use uh, less common Unicode encodings can cause machine learning models to just fall apart and have terrible performance. And this leads us to an attack on compilers and code. Uh, so moving us into the vulnerability that we describe uh, myself and my co-author Ross Anderson uh, as the set of Trojan source attacks. Um, we, we start by looking a little closer at that reordering uh, technique that I mentioned a few minutes ago. So uh, Unicode supports both left to right and right to left text. Uh, it does this to have more robust support for a variety of languages. For example, uh, it supports left to right languages like uh, English and Russian, but uh, it also supports right to left languages like uh, Hebrew and Arabic. Uh, and uh, whenever you have these conflicting directionalities uh, that are rendered in the same string, uh, you need to have some sort of an algorithm for deterministically saying uh, how those different uh, directionality character sets are, are going to render when they're next to each other. And in this case, we have something called the bidirectional algorithm, uh, which is defined by uh, the Unicode specification. And uh, as I understand that there's quite a lot of contention on how you actually pronounce to this, whether it's bidi or bidi or something like that. So, so take your, your choice and how you'd like to pronounce this algorithm, but uh, I'll call it BIDI. And BIDI control characters uh, enable fine-grained control of uh, mixing left to right and right to left text. So that is to say, uh, if I have some Hebrew that is contained within some English text, uh, the BIDI algorithm will have a default order that these characters are rendered. Uh, but if I don't like that default order, I, as the encoder of this text, could inject some control characters that will allow me to say, um, I would like these characters to be right to left and these characters to be left to right, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and then what we find is that as we um, can inject these right to left overrides and these left to right overrides um, you know, to our, our heart's desire, uh, we have very, very fine grained control of the visual display order of characters uh, regardless uh, of their underlying logically encoded order. Uh, and, and let's give a little bit of visualization for this. So these are some examples that, that, we, uh, that I pulled from the paper, but uh, first uh, look at this RLI character. Uh, RLI is a control character. Uh, it's uh, right to left isolate is what it stands for. Uh, and it is a character that says, take everything that follows uh, this character and treat it as a visual display order right to left. Uh, and then we have this other character, PDI, or pop directional isolate, uh, which says, okay, at this point, revert back to your standard order uh, as if we hadn't changed anything for the text that follows. Uh, and when we take these two characters and we put some traditionally left to right text uh, inside of them, uh, it, it doesn't matter that they're traditionally left to right, it will display in right to left order. So the, uh, so the substring ABC will display as CBA and we'll have no other uh, kind of visual perturbations uh, to, to show that this is actually uh, showing in the reverse of its logical encoding. Uh, and it seems pretty harmless when you look at it like this, but then on the next slide here, I'm going to give a, a slightly more complicated example, uh, because it turns out that these directionality control characters can be embedded inside of each other. Uh, so if we start uh, right here, you'll see that uh, this is that same example from the previous slide, uh, or almost, we're, we're saying that it's left to right this time, so uh, ABC should display left to right. And then we have this uh, DEF uh, 
characters that we also say should display left to right. So left to right isolate. Uh, so A, B, C, D, E, F, but it's all enclosed in this broader right to left isolate. So uh, this is going to say, okay, we have two different self-contained units, isolates, uh, A, B, C, and D, E, F, uh, and these characters should be left to right, but the overall order is right to left, so we're going to swap those two. So what we end up with is the uh, set of, of uh, characters D, E, F, A, B, C, uh, when we uh, visually render this text. Uh, and I think that this, uh, while it's not an overly complicated example, gives some idea of the amount of control you have over characters uh, as they are rendered when you understand the bidirectional algorithm that underlies the visual display order of text. So, so that takes us to the real vulnerability. So what we do is we say that source code, which can almost always be encoded as Unicode, uh, should have bidirectional control characters injected into it for this vulnerability. We're going to smuggle these characters into the code by embedding them in uh, parts of code that are typically uh, less constrained by compilers and interpreters. So uh, here I'm going to say comments and strings, although um, you know, these are broader examples. We could get much more specific for any particular language, but, but in the, the broad set of programming languages that exist, very often we have a way to uh, put a comment in code and we have a way to put a string literal in code. Uh, and so long as you are within the characters that delineate string literals uh, or delineate comments, um, then you can more or less inject any character you would like inside of those um, uh, those comments and those strings in most programming languages. Uh, and if we are dealing with a compiler or an interpreter that supports Unicode, this means that we have um, a more or less the full choice of those 144,000 some characters uh, that exist in the Unicode specification that we could put in. And, and the real kicker uh, is that we can choose to inject control characters. It doesn't have to just be a visible character for the vast majority of compilers and interpreters that exist in the modern world. So then uh, we, we get to the, the crux of the idea here, which is that we want to use reordering characters to make the code look different than it is. And we, um, if, we, if we just take the code and we jumble it so it uh, looks like uh, just random text, that, that doesn't do much for us. But uh, if we use these reordering control characters to make the program look like valid code, that is different than the logically encoded uh, order of the code. What we end up with uh, is the ability to create a program that looks like it does one thing, but actually does another thing because the compiler or the interpreter that's running this code is only going to care about the logically encoded order uh, of code that's ingested into it. It's just going to read these byte sequences and, and not uh, run the bidirectional algorithm to reorder the code before it uh, converts it to machine instructions or uh, whatever it is that this particular compiler is going to be doing. Uh, so looking then at the bottom of the screen, this uh, little animation here shows that um, if we start out with what it is now, uh, we have uh, some characters that look like code that are actually contained within a C style multi-line comment, um, but we inject some right to left and left to right overrides we can have um, it look like we had a comment that's followed by code when in fact this entire thing is, is just a comment. So uh, if uh, we now look on the next slide, uh, so we have this uh, same example here. Uh, it seems that we have an if statement, uh, a conditional block of code that will only be executed if the variable is admin is set to true. Um, however, it turns out that on the left side of the screen, which shows the uh, encoded order of text, the right side of the screen, which shows the visual display order of this text, uh, when we look at that encoding order, we realize that no, actually there, there is no if statement, that, that if statement doesn't exist at all, it's, it's just a multi-line comment. Uh, that all exists on a single line. Uh, and uh, once we render that, it looks as if there is this conditional control block. Uh, and once again, the same thing is true with the uh, uh, bracket, which would terminate that, that block. So uh, at the end of the day, when the compiler looks at this, the only thing it sees is that print statement uh, that would otherwise be contained inside of the if conditional. Uh, but, uh, you know, there, there is no if. So, um, you know, this is a pretty benign uh, toy example, uh, 
but uh, you could imagine something much more insidious here. Instead of just printing um, some you know, string to the console, you could have something that um, you know, makes some sort of a network call or gives you access to something that uh, you're not supposed to have access to. And uh, uh, the bottom line is that if a code reviewer is looking through this code, it is highly likely that they're going to be looking at the visual display order of the code if it's rendered to them and say a browser or a text editor or something like this and, and not the, log and not the uh, logically encoded bytes that, that underlie this. So if I am a code reviewer, I am very likely going to see the code that's on the right hand side of the slide. However, uh, what the compiler is going to see is on the left-hand side of this slide. And, and that's the real uh, issue that uh, we have and we're trying to expose with this uh, Trojan source vulnerability. Uh, but there is a, a second technique here, and that is uh, what we call the, the homoglyph technique. So uh, going back earlier when I was talking about there being uh, different characters that look very similar to each other, uh, that are actually represented by uh, different Unicode encodings under the hood, uh, what, uh, what we can see is that I could, uh, for example, in, in C++ define a function where I have a Latin H defining a function that says say hello, or is named say hello, uh, but I could also define a, a, a similar function that uses a Cyrillic H instead of a Latin H. Uh, and to the compiler, these are going to be distinct functions, despite the fact that rendered to the user, these are going to look like they're the same function. So imagine, for example, that I defined uh, the, the Trojan version of this function, the version that uses a Cyrillic age uh, in some open source package. And then I import this open source package or library into my code. And perhaps I, depending on the language, import it into the global namespace if namespaces uh, exist in this language. Uh, and all of a sudden, um, now I have this Trojan function that I can call that looks like some other function, but in fact runs uh, the version that uh, is this, this homoglyph version of the function, which might be defined to do something entirely adversarial, like, for example, take whatever arguments are passed to the function, send them to some command and control collection server somewhere, and then call the initial function, which would be uh, potentially very, very evil. So. Um, Anyways, uh, with the coloring that you see on, on uh, this uh, example on the screen, it, it makes it quite obvious that you're calling the version with the Cyrillic H, but uh, if you don't have that to uh, uh, you know, uh, show the, the underlying encoding and whatever text editor you're using, it uh, becomes much more tricky. And uh, we believe that uh, users of uh, code reviewers of this sort of uh, adversarial encodings are, are likely to be tricked into thinking that the innocent version is, is being called. So um, moving forward a little bit more uh, into coordinated disclosure, and this is the, the last thing that I want to talk about in the presentation portion. I'm hoping we can spend uh, much more time talking about the uh, underlying issues and, and how we can deal with them. Uh, but we offered a 99-day uh, embargoed window in which various different compilers, interpreters, code editors, uh, repositories like GitHub uh, could, could patch this vulnerability. Uh, and it was uh, actually exceptionally interesting to see how all of the different companies responded. Uh, and uh, ultimately, this will probably be an entirely separate paper where we go into much more depth on um, how all of these different companies responded to the vulnerability disclosure. But I'm going to try and sum it up into some of the key lessons that we learned throughout this process. So uh, the first thing is that especially as academics, you know, we're, we're looking for vulnerabilities that are, are new in some way that are academically interesting. Uh, and this means that they might not fit the uh, standard vulnerability patterns that um, companies are, are used to receiving. I mean, if I go and I describe to someone that there's a buffer overflow somewhere, there's a cross-site scripting vulnerability in a web application, that's uh, something that uh, vulnerability disclosure recipients employed at large companies are, are quite used to receiving. They're going to know how to triage those, and there's going to be a standard process that you can follow 
that will hopefully result in that vulnerability being patched. Uh, and indeed, we find that many um, large modern tech companies actually outsource uh, their vulnerability disclosure um, portals or, or interface with the company uh, to, to some third party that's going to triage all of these vulnerabilities for them and hopefully separate the signal from the noise, only giving them the signal and then throwing away all of the bogus uh, vulnerability disclosures that, that people send. And um, what we found is that uh, when we sent this vulnerability off to all of these different companies, a, a lot of places came back and said, yeah, this, this doesn't really fit something that we're used to seeing, so we're just going to ignore it, uh, or we're going to put it in some queue and maybe get to it someday or, or something like this. And um, it, it's hard to know what to do in those situations, but um, the two next points are, are things that we found. So one, uh, is to uh, kind of use extra impactful language when you uh, talk to various companies uh, giving uh, disclosures. So uh, if you if you just go through and say, look, we have the ability to inject uh, adversarial code by reordering um, uh, some source code to do this or that, it, and we found that that just didn't result in anything. But if instead you name a specific product, so you know this compiler. Uh, is uh, vulnerable in this way to, um, you know, being hijacked by uh, an actor online to inject uh, arbitrary functionality without the end user realizing and, and describe things kind of using that, that impact driven language, we found that this was at least less likely to be screened out, uh, kind of implying at least to me that um, the people receiving these disclosures probably aren't spending all that much time on each one, and you really have to kind of hook them in at the beginning of each disclosure. Uh, and then the other aspect to this is having a CDE identifier for a vulnerability is extremely helpful in talking to different companies. And it's actually a little funny that that's the case because getting a CDE is extremely easy. Um, and you can go to MITRE or some of these other organizations and just send an email to request a CVE and, and the workflow is that they will grant you one. They won't review it and then say, we don't think that this is needed. It's, I would like a CVE. Okay, here's an identifier. And if somebody thinks that the thing that you've described is not a vulnerability, they can later challenge that CVE, but they can't make it go away. Uh, so bottom line is these are really easy to get, but they're extremely helpful because for whatever reason, when you're disclosing things to different companies and you can say in the initial disclosure, this is tracked by CVE so and such or a set of CVE so and such, it's like immediately people start paying more attention. So kind of an interesting little, little tool that we found. Um, the, the next broad lesson is that um, US CERT, so you know, the cybersecurity kind of division of, of the government, uh, if you will, uh, has a, a shared communication tool. They call it Vince. Uh, and basically, if you reach out to CERT and you say, we have this vulnerability and we think that it affects more than one vendor and uh, we would like your help in notifying everyone who is uh, affected by this vulnerability, uh, then they'll say, great, we'll gladly help you talk to all of these different companies. In fact, we'll drive action with them so you can focus on just the research part of it. Uh, and they'll reach out to these different companies and invite them to a portal in this tool called Vince. Uh, and they will then receive all of the information that you send. They'll receive proofs of concept and the like in, in one central location. And, and better yet, all of these different vendors can communicate with each other uh, and uh, kind of you know, perhaps crowdsource across different products, the best solutions to solving uh, anything that might uh, span across the industry. Now, uh, the, the assumption here is that since it's run by, by CERT, uh, that if you're submitting a disclosure to uh, this group, you're also submitting that disclosure to the intelligence agencies and, and the government uh, itself. So you um, don't know entirely how that's going to be used. But um, despite that, uh, I think it's a very useful tool to be able to drive action across different companies with relatively low effort from uh, you as a, a researcher. Uh, and then the last thing, and, and this to me was uh, something I'd never thought about until going through this particular disclosure process, is that uh, open source tools can be very hard to report vulnerabilities to. So uh, imagine like GCC, which is Sure, one of the, the biggest compilers in the world and something that everyone has running on their computer one way or another. Uh, and yet it's an open source project, you know, run by GNU and uh, it's, it's hard to know how to send a vulnerability to the maintainers of this code because uh, 
the maintainers of that code do everything in a kind of open and, and transparent way, which is fantastic. But um, as far as we could discover, there was no sort of way to send an embargoed report to uh, uh, GCC or um, you know, a variety of other open source tools. And, and this means that either you have to go entirely public, in which case, um, you know, cats out of the bag, the other companies, um, you know, they don't get a chance to patch their tools. Um, but you know, then these these open source products can start, um, or you just have to skip these tools, and uh, and not include them in your vulnerability disclosure, which is quite the challenge. And, and I'll add, not every open source project has this problem. Uh, oftentimes, so like the the Rust project, for example, uh, they were fantastic to work with in these disclosures, and and they have uh, an email address that you can send some PGP mail to. Uh, and they will uh, work on getting a patch ready to go that they will uh, launch into the project at the same time that you go live with the report. So, you know, these are contributors to the project, but they're contributors that have um, kind of self-identified as, as security personnel and are willing to take an embargoed report and, and work on it and, and make pull requests once the information is ultimately public. Uh, and uh, then all of that is to say, there are a variety of different for-profit companies that uh, contribute very heavily to open source projects. So uh, the one that comes to mind right now is, is Red Hat, right? Red Hat Linux is uh, a, a flavor of the OS that lots of people use and lots of people pay for, especially at the enterprise level. And this means that you have maintainers of various different open source projects that work for companies like Red Hat uh, and it turns out that, uh, say, GCC, for example, is, is one of these tools that uh, they're uh, quite used to contributing to as a company. And it means that if you were already talking to a company like Red Hat and you had uh, an embargoed discussion with them of here's the vulnerability and, and what we would like to see patched, uh, most of the time they will say, well, in, in our interests as an operating system, we want to see this patched in all of the different tools. And we're hearing that there's you know, certain open source projects that you have no way to disclose to. So what we're going to do is we're going to ask our own employees to go you know, pre-write patches to all of the software. And the second that you make this report live, we'll have them do a pull request into the main repository. And uh, that in itself is just very, very interesting to me. Uh, and uh, the, the last slide that I'm going to show here is uh, one thing that I, I'm at least pretty happy with as an outcome of this Trojan source paper, and that's uh, the response that, that GitHub had. So uh, it took a little, bit of, um, uh, a little bit of work to motivate GitHub into making any different changes, but um, you know, it's, it's like the largest source code repository system that's used by developers, especially in open source projects. And, uh, nowadays, if you go view some code online that has bi-directional control characters in it, uh, you'll get this lovely warning message that <laughs> is uh, very apparent at the top of your, your files, uh, and you'll even get these little warning lines um, for the uh, uh, warning uh, logos for the lines of code that contain reordering characters. So. Um, in effect, they make it incredibly obvious what is going on in the code and is one of the many ways that you could defend against this particular vulnerability and to see it uh, rolled out in, in GitHub, but also other um, major code repository systems like uh, Bitbucket and, and GitLab are, are two others that have done something very similar. So um, this is one way that you could choose to defend against this. It's not the only way, but uh, I think it's pretty cool to see some uh, very, uh, visible change come uh, from these disclosures that we, we sent off. So anyways, with that, I will transition over to any questions that you have or anything that you would like to dive into, uh, perhaps use the, the rest of the time for discussion. So uh, thank you very much. Appreciate your time uh, and uh, glad to go deeper. Nicholas, that was awesome. Thank you so much. I think I'll kick us off with a, a simple question. Um, are there any interesting hacks you can do with the forward and backward delete characters with open source code? Like, can you write arbitrary code and just delete it all and have it not show up? Uh, yeah, that's a really interesting question. Um, and forgive me, I'm going to try to figure out how to stop sharing my screen. Here we go, brilliant. Okay, um, so the trouble with deletion characters is that they don't work in all contexts. So uh, it ends up being very specific to uh, the, the area where you're viewing text. So uh, if you have a, 
like say a web field that is uh, created for user input, like a, like a text box or something like that, uh, it's pretty likely in my experience that injecting a deletion character will cause the character next to it to just disappear. Uh, and likewise, if you have uh, some something that's designed for rendering text, like calling the print function in Python, it's also likely that that deletion character will be actioned. Uh, but if you just put a deletion control character uh, encoded in some HTML file that you are viewing in a web browser, it is much less likely that that control character will be actioned. Uh, typically, uh, I find that browsers just throw away these characters when they receive them inside of uh, HTML documents. And um, it, when it comes to code editors, it's very hit and miss, but the majority of the time it's a miss. So um, in theory, yes. But in practice, um, the behavior is too inconsistent with um, handling deletion control characters. Uh, for this to be a reliable attack that you, know, you could actually do something with, in my experience. That's super interesting. Thank you for the fantastic talk. I guess my question is not super technical, but I'm curious about your gut feeling with all of these patches coming out. Does it feel like, ah, yes, we've solved the problem. The internet will not be attacked by these Trojan, cord, uh, Trojan codes. Or is it like, hmm, I think there's going to be more stuff that's happened here, kind of a Pandora's box type thing? It's, it's hard to know. It's really hard to know. But um, what, what comes to mind for me is that, you know, you really only have to have a single major, um, like, common open source package be poisoned with something like this in one location, one time, for it to have a pretty massive impact across the industry. And like, this is this is pretty characteristic of supply chain attacks. Like you think of like some of the solar wind stuff and uh, various different things we've seen in the past year. But like, if you can if you can cause a problem in one common location, that problem is likely to affect the entire ecosystem. But it's also likely to persist in that ecosystem even after the vulnerability is patched. So you know, I think I'm I'm very excited by all of the different defenses that I've seen against this that have popped up since we put the paper online in November. Like, um, I think that some of the most impactful ones are um, the the code repositories, things like the the GitHub example that I just showed, because anyone who sees some massive warning banner across their code is is not going to approve a, a pull request into that repository. They're at the very least going to say what's going on here and, and follow some of the links to learn more. Uh, and actually, more recently, I've seen some of the code editors themselves implement the same behavior. So Visual Studio Code, for example, another Microsoft and GitHub product here, um, will will display a similar warning banner and uh, will will visualize these control characters as like their Unicode code point representation instead of actioning the control characters as I typically describe it. They'll just show them as as a rendered glyph. Uh, so I think all of these things are are going to be really fantastic. But like. The, the scenario that concerns me the most is like you have um, something that follows a little bit less common of a pattern for an open source project. Like maybe you have some legacy code that is um, kept in some um, version control system that's not visualized online or it's visualized online in a less common tool. Uh, and maybe the um, maintainers of this project um, use code editors that don't have defenses against this particular vulnerability and you know perhaps they compile with something like um, I don't know maybe it's written in Java. Java is something that doesn't have defenses against this particular attack and um, you know if they um, get this code committed to the repository and it, it makes its way into the build system warnings aren't thrown there's no visual uh, indication that something's going on like you know, this vulnerability could be really, really tough. And let's just, let's say for a moment that this uh, legacy Java application that we're imagining is a package that's been pulled into um, other Java code, so even Java code that might be uh, you know, hosted on, on GitHub or something like that. But um, if it maybe is that homoglyph variant of this attack where you have a Trojan version of the function, um, it might not be super clear that you're exploiting that uh, because the code is going to be an independency that's not hosted on this platform. Uh, and at least as of now, GitHub doesn't have defenses against the kind of non-ASCII function definition. So um, it, it's hard to know, 
Um, I'm, I don't think it's the sort of thing that everyone should be panicking about immediately. I don't think it's like every system has to go be patched, but I do think that it's, um, it's something to spread awareness about because there could be something really terrible that happens if, uh, if this does happen uh, in, in a real repository. I've got more questions, but I'll wait a minute for anyone else to go first if you want. Yeah, I, I have a question. Great talk, by the way. Uh, you mentioned going directly to uh, to companies to let mm. them know about this vulnerability. Yeah. Is that kind of the accepted way of doing it if you discover a vulnerability? Or did you feel like you had to do that because like CISA and CERT weren't enough to really get the point across? Well, we actually started by going directly to the companies and only came across the, the CERT coordinated disclosure assistance uh, later during the disclosure period. So for the first uh, couple of months, we were just submitting directly to companies. And frankly, there's actually some incentive to do so, because if you go through CERT, you're not participating in the bug bounty programs that are offered by these companies. But if you um, go directly to the companies, they might decide, hey, we appreciate that you did this. Here's you know, two thousand um, dollars. Use this in your research budget, et cetera, et cetera. So, like, there's there's some advantage to going directly to the companies, but um, you know, I think it's I think it's more or less expected uh, that you will do some amount of disclosure. Like, um, you know, from the from the academic perspective here, if you are going to write up a paper and submit it to a conference, typically it's going to say something like, if this research involves uh, either human subjects or new vulnerabilities. Um, write an ethics section describing how you handled the situation. And uh, it, from what I've heard from colleagues, if you don't go through this particular process, you might find that uh, that's grounds for getting the paper rejected from some conference because uh, what you did is, is probably not viewed as ethical if you're posting what is an effective zero day vulnerability uh, online without giving uh, at least the, uh, the companies you know are affected a chance to, to patch the vulnerability. So uh, yeah, in short, um, we did think that it was necessary to go to the companies. Uh, going through CERT might be sufficient uh, if you start there, but uh, you don't get to participate in the bug bounty process. You mentioned uh, that uh, some companies were like just putting it to the side because it wasn't similar. So do you think like these bounty bug bounties are counterproductive to, to do you think that maybe they would have paid more attention if you had just come straight with like for, through a government agency? I've, I've given a lot of thought to that one. And I just, I spin in circles on that question all the time. I, I, I really don't know because, um, you know, the majority of the companies that outsourced their vulnerability disclosure um, immediately marked this paper as not a problem for their service and, you know, ignore without bug bounty, don't send to the company, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, what we realized later is that, that there are often some magic words that you can say, like, um, please send this to a full-time employee at the company. And then uh, oftentimes these third parties are obligated to flag it for their security team to review. And by the time we got to that stage, we typically found that we got by it from the companies to do something about this. Um, that being said, there were also companies that did not outsource their vulnerability disclosure that, um, you know, presumably it must have been reviewed by a full-time internal security team, but we didn't get any action from these companies whatsoever. And uh, we got a whole bunch of different uh, responses. So uh, there was uh, one large tech company who sent us um, uh, an excerpt from some sort of legal policy or terms and conditions that felt very threatening. Uh, it sounded a lot like, uh, if you release this, we're going to take legal action against you because this is it. And it's like, that That feels like something that you wouldn't expect in 2021 or 2022. This feels like it would have been 20 years ago. Like, it's surprising to see um, big tech companies acting like that in, in certain cases, but, um, you know, we had another large tech company that we sent stuff off to that just never responded. <laughs> In fact, uh, we even, we, we did get responses back saying like, uh, we have confirmed that we have received this. Uh, and then it's like, yes, but are you going to do anything about it? And they're like, yes, we've confirmed that we've received this. And then just, you know, 
radio silence. And then nothing ever happens. No patches come out. These particular compilers created by these large tech companies, you can still throw stuff at them and it'll gladly accept all of these things. And um, then we also had some companies that said, look, we, we see that this is uh, an issue, but we don't think that this is an issue for us. And that's perhaps a, a valid thing. In fact, maybe maybe we even want to talk some more about this. Like, where is the correct place to patch something like this? Like, I, I feel like I can make an argument that this is an issue for compilers and interpreters. Uh, and I would argue that probably the best place to protect against something like this is in a language specification to say you shouldn't be able to put unescaped directionality control characters uh, inside of these particular linguistic constructs. And then presumably that would be inherited by compilers, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, or you might say that the correct place to do this is in the Unicode specification, which actually gives recommendations for specific types of applications, um, like for example, compilers and interpreters. And uh, in uh, effect, there's actually been uh, a, a proposal to form a Unicode working group to make a modification to the subsequent version of the Unicode specification to uh, do exactly that, recommends that uh, bidirectional control characters don't be included in um, at-risk constructs and programming language specifications. But, you know, so long as it's not defined in the programming language spec, I mean, if a compiler and interpreter chooses to throw an error, you might describe that as a compiler that is uh, taking its own stance on undefined behavior, which is potentially problematic. Uh, and, and then you do have these companies that have said, well, you know, we just don't think it's a problem for compilers or interpreters. It's a problem for how someone views their code, uh, in which case it should be something that is handled in IDEs or code editors or things like this. And um, we've probably got the most buy-in from uh, code repository front ends like GitHub and GitLab and, and Bitbucket and, and the like. But um, you know, all the same, if you don't use those tools to visualize your code and the compiler accepts it, well, you're, you're kind of out of luck. So um, anyways, that's a, a long answer to the question, but uh, I, I really, I don't know. I guess one other quick uh, fun question about the code front ends would be when GitHub, for example, released their patch to go detect some of these characters mm -hmm. uh, and see if the Trojan source attacks were happening, did you guys find anything? Did, was anyone using this? Do you think you're the first one to discover this? Yeah, this this is a really interesting question. So um, once we got some buy-in from GitHub, they offered to help us with scanning the ecosystem uh, to try and identify usage patterns for this attack. So what that looked like in practice is we came up with some regular expressions that uh, would go find stuff that looked like reordering attacks in source code. We gave it to GitHub, they scanned their backend and then gave us back all of the public results. And we, we took a look through those and uh, we being me and took a look through those being spending days clicking through code files, trying to visualize uh, you know these invisible control characters. And uh, I actually have a tool that I put ironically on GitHub that you can use to look through other GitHub commits and, and find all of this sorts of stuff. But um, the answer is kind of. So um, the most the most interesting uh, use case that I found was in smart contracts. So uh, there's uh, a really cool uh, or insidious or evil or whatever you want to call it trick that at least one person seems to have used uh, in a smart contract to switch the sender and the receiver of uh, a, a function call, which should have said this person sends money to this person, uh, but it was swapped. And well, guess what? When that contract executes, you know, so money is flowing the wrong direction. Uh, and we found some news write-ups on this. And, and actually the, the place where we came across it first is that we found um, uh, kind of static code analysis or linter tools, things like this, uh, specifically for a variety of, of smart contract frameworks uh, that were looking for these characters. Or like, well, why are they looking for those characters? And then we stumbled across a couple sort of obscure news stories on this process. So in that sense, yes, absolutely. Uh, there is also someone who made a comment, uh, they created an issue on the um, Go language, uh, like compiler repo in, in GitHub, uh, something like five years ago saying, hey, it looks like we could probably do something scary with bidirectional control characters. Should we do something about this? And the consensus on that GitHub issue was, nah, it doesn't seem like it's too much of a problem. Uh, and uh, it's kind of interesting to look back and see like, huh, you know, it feels like this could have been something that was addressed a long time ago and for whatever reason wasn't. And in some very specific areas was actually being exploited like the smart contracts. Uh, and uh, there was actually one other use case I found that was kind of interesting. And that's, um, 
code obfuscators for interpreted languages. Uh, so uh, specifically JavaScript, it, it uh, turns out there's uh, you know, a decent incentive to make your, your JavaScript code very obscure uh, when it's in a, a browser. So uh, maybe an app like, you know, like the Instagram website or something like that is harder to reverse engineer. Uh, and there's all sorts of, you know, code minimization and obfuscation techniques. But one of the less common ones is to inject bidirectional control characters into the um, minimized and obfuscated code to try and make it harder to be able to read. It's kind of trivial to get around once you know that it's happening but it is something that I saw examples of online. So uh, yeah, th that's the examples that, that we found in the wild. That is super cool, thank you. <laughs> okay, we have a question from Giorgio in the um, messaging. He says, great talk and super interesting comments on the disclosure process. Did you happen to look at malware and see if any of those techniques were used also to evade anti-malware? Mm, uh, so, so this is a really interesting point. Um, I think, well, the first thing I'll say is that it is hard to look at malware collectively in one specific location. I guess if you're a company like uh, one of the antivirus groups, like maybe maybe you have um, large collections of this stuff that you can go look through. But uh, in general, the best way for collecting malware that I came across was like people who put things on GitHub saying this is malware, uh, <laughs> and in which case it would have been caught in our, our ecosystem scanning. But um, to the extent that we did look at this, uh, it was looking through uh, write-ups for um, malware, like, like um, uh, something that a, a security company might put out saying, here's a vulnerability you should patch, and here's why, because this is how the vulnerability works. Uh, and there were a couple of write-ups that I found uh, primarily by Microsoft uh, that go back 20 years or more uh, saying, hey, we have this piece of malware that does something evil and it does this using directionality control characters. Now, I'll, I'll point out, it does this evil stuff not by using directionality control characters in the source code, because presumably if you're producing malware and, and disseminating it on your own, um, you compile the code yourself and it doesn't matter what the source code actually looks like, but there are examples of things that it's very advantageous to be able to trick an end user into thinking something's different than it was. And, and my absolute favorite version of this attack is you throw a right to left override character in a file name. So therefore the extension looks different than it actually is. So I can make something that looks like it's a .txt file, but in, in fact is a .exe file uh, that some Windows user is going to click on thinking they're looking at some text and uh, accidentally run some executable that's going to install something on their computer. So um, now that is something you can defend against as an OS designer once you know that it exists, but 20 years ago, people didn't realize that exists and it launched into this whole breed of primarily email disseminated malware disguised as things like text files and PowerPoints and Word documents and the like. So, uh, and, and there were some others that used um, like malware that would attempt to corrupt like configuration files and things like that by injecting right to left overrides and, and making them uh, look different than they actually were. And some of these have existed for, for quite a long period of time as well. So it, it seems that primarily driven by email based spam um, about 20 years ago, there was a, a pretty large interest in this area and it kind of died off. But as far as I can see, no one ever looked at it in the context of source code and trying to launch supply chain attacks, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Can I ask another question or does someone else want to go? Uh, I guess I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, someone said something? I, I have a quick one. Um, I, I was curious if, if uh, there are any valid uses for these characters in, in source code and also does GitHub differentiate between valid and invalid? Like, I'm, I'm just imagining if I write my Java doc in Hebrew, like, I feel like I should be allowed right. to do that without my GitHub being mad at me. Yes, indeed. Um, there are there are lots of valid use cases, but, but the first thing I'll, I'll point out is that the bidirectional algorithm that Unicode uses to display text is actually pretty good in its default configuration. So if I have source code in, 
um, you know, some language like Java or Python or something like that that's that's always written left to right. And then I write a comment in, in Hebrew, the bidirectional algorithm uh, will almost always be good enough to say show almost all of it in left to right. And then we get to this block that is just, you know, a consecutive Hebrew text that's displayed just this part in, in right to left. Uh, and you may choose to use bidirectional control characters to override that order, like for whatever reason, I wanted to display my Hebrew characters in, in left to right. Um, but, but the default order is going to uh, cover you in the majority of situations. Now, that being said, these little edge cases that you get into um, are potentially much more common than at least I would have initially thought. Like, for example, uh, you have some um, source code that's left to right that has a comment that's in Hebrew that references something that's a function name that looks like English, but then the argument to that function is Arabic numerals and like you put all of this stuff together and it's like wow there's a there's a lot of different linguistic things that are happening here so there are totally valid reasons that you might uh, want to override uh, the default display order. They're just not that common. And, and on the GitHub side of things, uh, they do show that warning banner regardless of the use case. It doesn't attempt to find benevolent use cases, um, but it, it doesn't do anything to stop you from interacting with that repo. It's not like some sort of, you know, compiler breaking error or something like this. It's just a, just a visual warning to help you understand what's going on at the encoding level. Oh, thank you. So yeah, yeah, I guess that might be an argument for not handling this at the compiler level. Um, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there there's really good arguments for why it should or shouldn't be handled at, I think, most of the different layers in the stack, um, but compilers in particular. Um, so uh, like, okay, what's, what's an example? Um, so like Rust has taken the position that you absolutely should not be allowed to put these characters in the code, no matter what, you should use the default display ordering of, of Bidi or, or Bidai or whatever you want to call it. And uh, if you need to print out these uh, control characters, you should use escape sequences to generate them. Uh, and if you want something else, sorry, it's not supported. Uh, and then, you know, you've got languages like Java that said, do whatever you want, it's yours to do. We only care about the logically encoded order. Um, you know, if you want something else, it's up to your text editor to, to tell you what the problem is. And then you have something in between uh, like what GCC has adopted just recently. And in this case, they say, look, we're gonna throw a warning if we detect uh, a bidirectionality control character inside your source code, but you, it's on by default, but you could turn off this wording if you don't want it, uh, or it's a warning, you could just ignore it. It doesn't necessarily do anything. I mean, GCC often spits out a bajillion warnings if you compile some large project. So um, yeah, there, you're, you're totally right. There's a, there's a strong argument for that. I think just the, the issue that I saw in the disclosure process is every part of the pipeline wanted to say that it was somebody else's problem. And at least for the first month, no one would do anything about it because of that. So uh, it's, uh, you're right, but also it's, it's tough. All right, so um, that's awesome. So maybe one one question here that I've been thinking about is, I really appreciated the narrative style, and it seems like you started to do some things of like, oh, let's see if we can get this machine learning model to do something it's not supposed to, which is interesting, but it's not exactly like 100% unique types of research. But then going in this direction is something I haven't seen before. So even if someone from Golang figured something related to it out five years ago, it's, um, it seems like you took a lot of interesting turns. And I'm curious if there are any, like, any things you learned that you weren't expecting to learn, like about research or about presentations to get people to listen to it. Any thoughts on that, I guess? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the first thing that comes to mind is writing a paper that's going to get accepted at a machine learning conference is very different than a paper that's going to get accepted at a security conference. Uh, and there's just, you know, different ways of, of phrasing things like, for example, uh, or, or frankly, a, a programming language style conference. So, you know, one of these things is going to be using lots of um, mathematical and statistics notations uh, in the paper for the ML conference, the security conference. Uh, it seems like if you put too much of the fancy math symbols in papers, it's almost on grounds to get rejected just for that. <laughs> right? And then you get to the programming languages conference and there's all sort of the, um, uh, you know, the, the formal 
uh, programming language specification representations that you would be expected to use. So uh, I think you know that that's probably pretty obvious. But when you take similar techniques and apply them to different venues like this, uh, that is at least something that comes to mind uh, as you're writing these different papers. I mean, the um, the machine learning version of the paper got rejected from the first conference we sent it to, and now it's appearing at uh, IEEE Security and Privacy this year. So it's like kind of flip flop from absolutely no way to change how you're phrasing a little bit to like, oh yeah, we'll, we'll gladly show it at a top venue. Uh, and um, yeah, I, I think there's there's also a lot to be said about the vulnerability disclosure side. I, I think I mentioned before that like the way that you pitch these vulnerabilities to the companies that you're talking to uh, largely seems to describe whether or not they're going to engage with you in, in the first place. And um, like from an academic point of view, um, the the expectation seems to be that you're going to describe something using as objective language as you can, and you're going to say what well, might be able to do this, it might be able to do that. But I just found that that was not working with any of the companies that we talked to. Like instead, you have to say this is going to break your system, and everyone is going to be able to do everything they want. And please read this paper. And then all of a sudden, they're like, oh my god, you know, we got to do something. So, um, yeah, I, that's that's the the stuff that comes to mind and there's probably lots of other ways that you could you could take this stuff i mean look people have been doing attacks that use strange unicode encodings for a variety of different things for decades right like that part of this isn't new but i think thinking about newer systems and to the fact that unicode is like everywhere now it's so ubiquitous there's probably a lot more that could be done. Like one thing that um, I haven't figured out how to exploit yet, but I think might be an interesting path if, if somebody can figure something out is that Unicode describes these, uh, what they call the private blocks, uh, which are uh, parts of the, um, the valid encoding range uh, that aren't specified in the, the vanilla Unicode specification. And the intention, as I understand it, is that large corporations might want to define these, uh, these code points to represent something specific to their company. Maybe I want my company logo to be one of the Unicode code points, or I wanna have some special symbols that I use particularly inside of my company. But it seems to me like that ambiguity in the specification could potentially be used to do something pretty evil across a whole bunch of different domains. Just don't know what it is yet. So we'll see. That's Nicholas, you, you should attend the Langsec workshop while you're at S&P this year, because I think the folks there would be very interested in this stuff. I don't know if you're familiar with that community. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm not. Uh, is so this, uh, Langsec is language theoretic security. And uh -huh. they're all about parser vulnerabilities and, and they have nice. a workshop at S&P every year. And oh, yeah. um, it's a community that I think would be very receptive to, uh, to this research. So I would, I would encourage you to reach out to some of them. Yeah, absolutely. Well, um, most certainly. And hopefully we'll see everyone there, assuming it actually happens in person this year. Yeah. <laughs> so. By the way, I had a paper... Um, I don't remember if it was S&P or Usenix, but one of the reviewers said that we clearly didn't speak good English because we misspelled if as IFF in a proof, <laughs> <laughs> which is fucking incredible. <laughs> so That's to your point really about, yeah, about uh, uh, mathematical lingo sometimes being an issue. Well, I think we should wrap yeah. up pretty soon, but if anybody has maybe a last question to, uh, to close us out with, this is your time to speak or forever hold your peace. Hey, I might throw out one other thing that's kind of interesting. Um, and, and this is part of the conference submission process is that uh, coordinated disclosure and peer reviews and conferences uh, and releasing vulnerabilities to the public, um, these, things, these three things don't play nicely with each other. And mm. this is something that we came across with this particular paper. And we thought that we had it down to a science that we had read all of the rules and we knew exactly what we could and couldn't say and where we could say it and who we could say it to and we we're doing it the most ethical way possible uh, and the timing of everything was such that uh, we had submitted it to you know a top tier conference it was under review and uh, we had just finished the rebuttal cycle and that small period between the end of the, the rebuttal cycle and uh, when decisions are announced is when it was scheduled to be publicly released. And it was something that we just, 
we couldn't change because we had started it, you mm -hmm. know, like a third of a year earlier or something like that when we sent the first disclosure. Uh, so what we did was we, we reached out to the program committee chairs, like before we had even submitted the paper to the conference and said, would you be amenable to us releasing this information uh, right at the end of the period? We, we think that since it's after the rebuttal period, it's probably not going to you know, corrupt the peer review process because the review should be finished by then. And they went back and said, yeah, it doesn't seem like it'll cause a problem. That that should be just fine. Uh, and then what we found uh, ultimately is that the paper was rejected from this particular conference. And most of the reviewers went back and edited their initial reviews to say, uh, you broke the, um, <laughs> the, the double blind process. Uh, and, you know, on those grounds, uh, you need to send it somewhere else. <laughs> That's incredible. Me? So it, it's tough to know how to balance these things. Well, wow. your paper was rejected because you're protecting the internet. Nice. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> Nicholas, yeah, we actually awesome. got a lovely response back from the program committee chairs of uh, of this conference saying, yeah, sorry that we told you you could do that. It turns <laughs> out we should have said otherwise. And it's like, wow, okay, great. That's, thank you. <laughs> so, anyways. All right, well, thank you so much for talking to us today, Nicholas. This was a blast. Um, the talk will be online uh, either very late tonight or sometime tomorrow. And um, uh, so if if people want to watch the, the video, uh, they, they'll be able to. And um, uh, super cool hack. So <laughs> kudos for coming up with this. We, we really enjoyed it when we read about it. And it was even cooler hearing about it. So thank you so much for joining us. Thank you all very much. Appreciate your time. And uh, feel free to reach out if there's uh, anything you'd like more info on. Sounds good. All right. Thank adios. You. Bye. Bye-bye.